remarks this morning are quite brief, and I'm going to focus in my word of appreciation on my first and decisive encounters with Gordon, namely my years as a student at Wheaton College. And I should just stop here and say, um, if we are supposed to be speaking in order, um, I'm dreadfully out of order here. <laughs> I did the math, and that was about 41 years ago. <laughs> Which is remarkable given the fact that I'm only, you know, 50. But <laughs> I entered Wheaton College as a literature major, and I'd always assumed that I would go on and teach literature. At some point, I'm pretty sure it was in geology class, I remember thinking, I want to teach at the college level. This has nothing to do with geology, this is just what I was thinking about. <laughs> and that meant I knew that I had to get a PhD, so this was my track, I was going to get a PhD and teach literature. As a student at Wheaton, then in the curriculum, we had to take five classes in Bible and theology. The first one I took was called BR10, Christ and Culture. I saw Don Hagner back there. There's Don. Don was the professor in that class. <laughs> I think all the freshmen took it. We read, among other things, Augustine's City of God and Niebuhr's Christ and Culture. This was very heady stuff for college first years. <laughs> then I took BR20, Introduction to the Old Testament. Now the next class you were supposed to take was BR30, Introduction to the New Testament. But somehow I got out of sync, and there was a class offered, BR40, under the rubric Christian Thought. And the course that I signed up for under Christian Thought was Gordon Fee's New Testament Theology. Mm. Later, I would take BR30, Introduction to the New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> but I took those two classes, and as they say, the rest was history. <laughs> It was in these two classes that I discovered how interesting the formal study of the New Testament actually was. Here for the first time, I actually learned what the kingdom of God was about. I learned about the differences in the synoptic gospels and made me the one person in all the world who went into PhD studies because I love a synopsis, having learned it from Gordon Fee. I learned about form criticism, how we might think about the I am sayings in the Gospel of John, more on that later, the possibility of pseudepigraphy in 2 Peter, and much more. Not surprisingly, I learned text criticism from Gordon, and I still have my notes from the, that class on the ending of Mark, and that is still the example I use to explain how text criticism works. And I can still see Gordon writing on the board, shorter ending, longer ending, shorter and longer ending. And then I can hear him saying, and I say this to my class to this day, the shorter ending is absolutely not Markin. So <laughs> there are certain phrases that just ring in your ears and you never, you know, you never forget. For the New Testament theology class, and I actually have these, these notes I took, and I said, dug them out the other day, you know, a purple mimeoed uh, syllabus. We were given a supplementary bibliography from which we were to read 35 pages for each class session. So I looked at the names and he had gone through and told us, you know, this is so-and-so and here I had an asterisk or a, a, a check. Rudolf Bultmann, I'm just going to give you some of them. You know, 20-year-old students, 21-year-old maybe. Rudolf Bultmann, Reverend Childs, jo Joachim Jeremias, Ernst Kesemann, Kummel, George Ladd, I think this was the first time I ever read, read George Ladd, was in Gordon's class. Adolf Schlatter, uh, the English version, not uh, German. <laughs> Rudolf Schnackenburg, whose very name I thought was impressive. <laughs> That's right. And many others. That too was heady stuff for college students. But Gordon expected us to read the greats. And then we had to report on what we read. We had to turn in note cards on our readings. Those I don't have. But he expected us to read Roman Catholic, Protestant, evangelical, liberal, and conservative scholars if they wrote on the relevant topics. My notes for that course, which I still have even if I don't have the note cards, are a combination of reporting on the various schools of New Testament theology, how Kuhlmann did it, how Bultmann did it, uh, and of course extensive lectures on various important texts in the Gospels, Paul and John, and numerous observations in which Gordon was in fact not just reporting but doing his own theology right in front of us. He often mused aloud about various problems, and when he introduced Johannine theology, he began by saying this, and I have a double asterisk by it in my notes, and it may explain what happened to me. 
the greatest problems in the New Testament come in the Johannine literature. So for some reason, I took that as a challenge. <laughs> I have spent my life working on the Gospel of John. Of course, it's wonderful. I was intrigued. All this study was enormously interesting to me. And I suspect, as so many have said this morning, it was enormously interesting because Gordon was enormously interesting. He would often begin class by having us sing. I remember once he came in and started turning back and wrote something on the board, and then when we sang the hymn for the morning, I knew that what he had been writing out was, what's the right order for singing in the song, Praise the Savior, ye who know him? Then we shall be where we would be, then we shall be what we should be, things that are not now nor could be, and you can see he had written, one should be. <laughs> well, do you know what order they go in? <laughs> And I remember once after we sang, he said to us, they don't start class that way at the State University. Mm -hmm. Indeed, they didn't. Nor would they have continued class in the way that Gordon inimitably did, blending sermonic exhortations with analysis of texts and trends on scholarship. I remember him telling us once how troubled he was when the preacher on Easter had tried to prove the resurrection to the congregation. <laughs> and he was so upset he said, you don't argue for the res resurrection, you preach it. <laughs> and so he did. He often, as many have said, preached the text to us. How could you not get interested in the kingdom of God when Gordon was explaining it by proclaiming it? Gordon's was the first class I ever wrote a critical book review for. I had no idea what a critical book review was. <laughs> but he gave us hard assignments, and he gave us hard tests. He would tell us, oh, study hard. And then he would say this, and do not skip chapel to do it. <laughs> so, Gordon, this is my confession. <laughs> I skip chapel. This is <laughs> number of cuts each quarter, and that seems like a pretty good thing to take. <laughs> but the fact that he made the study of the New Testament challenging and made us learn and think was all part of the appeal. I suppose it's not unusual to speak of persons who blend piety and scholarship, but for me, Gordon blended piety and scholarship with and into what I can only call wisdom. And so I instinctively trusted and still trust his judgments. I can remember trying to explain to another woman on my dorm floor something about the Gospel of John that Gordon had said to us, which made perfect sense to me but seemed to flummox her and the other students. How could anyone say such things about the Gospel of John? How could anyone hint that it might not have been written by the Apostle? How could anyone say that he made that Jesus may not have uttered some of the I am sayings, but, and you can hear Gordon, but if you ask me if they are true, yes they are. Well, I've spent my life pursuing the kinds of questions I learned to ask there, and I hope I have spent my life pursuing them with the kind of wisdom and the posture of both humility and courage that Gordon has exhibited. One thing I learned from Gordon, you teach who you are whether you mean to or not. Over the years, I've bumped into Gordon on a in a variety of venues. I've read his articles, John 737, The Living Water. I agree with him, he's right, so. <laughs> Before coming to SBL, I was working on a lecture that I give when I go home, and I was consulting Gordon's commentary on 1 Corinthians, as I know so many of us have. And I will say, I remember him saying this, um, that when he was finishing 1 Corinthians, he worked on it 14 hours a day. Having just finished a long commentary on the Gospel of John, I find that just totally discouraging. Who, who, who works 14 hours a day? <laughs> I'm lucky to get four or five. You know. But everything that I've learned from and about Gordon in the decades since my years in his classes has only confirmed what I first learned about him in the cl that classroom up in Edmond Chapel. So Gordon, for your inspiration, your faith, your challenge, your rigor, and your wisdom, thank you and bless you. Amen.